Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Ah, there we are. Fantastic. Fantastic. Welcome. Welcome to the LSE for the closing night of the LSE Festival, New World Disorders, which is run this whole week and is part of a, a year-long theme which will enable people at the LSE to explore the shifting geopolitics of our times, disintegrating democracies, reconfigurations of identity and technological transformations. My name is Binu Shafiq. I'm the director of the LSE. And tonight, we're going to talk about what the world will look like in the not too distant future. The question for tonight is by 2035, how could the way we live, work, and interact with each other and understand ourselves have changed? We've been having this debate through the festival week in various ways and during the events, but also on social media. And so looking at the threats and the opportunities that the future holds and seeing if they make us feel more optimistic about the future or more pessimistic about the future. I chaired the opening session of the festival and we took a vote at the end of that session and the audience was exactly evenly split 50-50 as to whether they felt more pessimistic or optimistic. And tonight, we will conclude the session with another vote and take a, a, on, on that same question and see how you're feeling at the end of this week. We have a fantastic panel of academics uh, who are here to provide some informed speculation about the future in their respective areas of expertise. Uh, and I think this is going to be a really fun way to spend a Saturday night. <laughs> now, recognizing, and they're going to explore what are the dangers, what to, how together could we imagine a better future, and what role can social science play in getting us to a better future. Let me introduce them all in one go. You will hear their five to seven minute pitches in sequence, and then at the end of that, we'll have a, com a collective discussion. So first, we'll hear from George Lawson, who's an associate professor in the Department of International Relations here at the LSE. He'll be followed by Rebecca Elliott, assistant professor in the Department of Sociology. She will be followed by Sita Pina Gandharadharan, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Media and Communications. Then she'll be followed by Liam Kofi Bright, assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy, Logic, and Scientific Method. He'll be followed by Ilka Gleibs, who is assistant professor in social and organizational psychology in the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Sciences at LSE. And then finally, we'll have Barbara Fasolo, who's associate professor of behavioral sciences in the Department of Management at LSE. Each of them will have five minutes to present their best and worst case scenarios of the future in their area of expertise. And once they've shared that perspective, we will turn to you and to get your views about threats and opportunities that you see in the near future. And I'll also share some comments that we've been getting in from social media. Just to remind Twitter users the, uh, and the audience watching live stream, the hashtag for tonight's event is hashtag LSE Festival or hashtag New World Disorders. And I'll now invite George Lawson to start us off. Evening, everyone. Uh, once upon a time, I worked in the travel business. And this isn't the beginning of a bad joke. I really did work in the travel business. And uh, every year, the boss of the business would come along and tell us this had been an excellent year, apart from one thing. Now, that one thing varied. Sometimes there had been a natural disaster in a particular part of the world that we traveled to. Sometimes there had been political instability in a region that disturbed travel plans. Sometimes there had been a shock to exchange rates. Sometimes there had been a strike by French air traffic controllers. <laughs> Some things never change. Uh, but after a few years of this, I realized that there was always something. Now, the catch was that this something always changed. So you never knew what the one thing was. You just knew that there was going to be something. The specific X factor that precluded the business being successful wasn't predictable. But the general fact of its existence was predictable. There was always something year after year. 
Once I'd worked that out, I didn't stay in the travel business uh, for very long, uh, as you can see, but I did take a lesson uh, with me when I left. Scenarios about the future need to concentrate on patterns rather than specifics. And that's what I'm gonna do this evening. I wanna talk about one pattern and then a couple of dynamics within that basic pattern. And the particular pattern I wanna highlight is the changing structure of world politics. Over the past couple of centuries, international order has been defined, what I put up there as the first bullet point, by centered globalism. So it's been a global order, the world's first truly global order, I would argue, but once underpinned, hence centered, by Western power. In the contemporary world, we have the simultaneous spreading and deepening of this order. So on the one hand, I think globalizing dynamics are intensifying when you think about finance, you think about production, you think about communications, you think about travel, you think about governance. We, I know that we talk about some of the fracturing of global governance, but actually when you look around, you actually see to, to a great extent a thickening of forums of global governance, particularly uh, in areas of the world that aren't predominantly Western. Think about the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization, and so on. So that is the deepening. On the other hand, I think the power differentials that marked the era of centered globalism are diminishing, and we know this development by many names. The decline of the US, and maybe of the West in general, the rise or return of China as you prefer, the emergence of the BRICS, and so on, and that's the spreading. So the big structural pattern I want to highlight, the big shift, is the one from centered globalism, where I think we've been over the last couple of centuries, to decentered globalism, which is where I think we are now and will be in the next decade or two. Just as we're becoming more global, we're also becoming more plural in terms of centers of power around the world. Now, I think the direction of travel of this big pattern of this structural shift uh, is there. It might be faster or slower. It might be deeper or shallower. That's the kind of X factor, uh, like the travel business example that I gave at the beginning of my remarks. But I think the basic trajectory is clear. And by 2035, my best guess for what it's worth, and I really mean that. I'm not actually being modest. I'm terrible at predictions, particularly about the future. But the, my best guess of by 2035 is that that pattern will be well established. So that's what I think we know. Here's what I think we don't know, and whether we'll be optimistic or pessimistic about this, I'll leave to your voting, but I'll give you a couple of things to get you started in your thinking. If we think about conflict, enhanced prospects of conflict, which is effectively my pessimistic scenario, I think that great power war is a remote possibility. The contemporary world isn't like the 1930s. People often make that kind of analogy, make that kind of comparison, and I don't think it stands up particularly well. In the 1930s, imperialism was legitimate. War was a normal, considered to be rational policy option. Ideological differences between states were acute, far more acute than they are today. You think about the differences between liberal, communist, and various forms of fascist state, for example. And despite the popular surge of recent years, the ideological bandwidth of states in the contemporary world is actually relatively narrow. At the same time, nuclear weapons have made great power war irrational, we hope, and formal imperialism, at least, is illegitimate. And at the same time, we have this deeply embedded system of global governance. If you think about the uh, financial crisis of 2007 8 then at least one lesson I took from that was actually that that considerable stress test to international financial institutions, to global governance more generally, the lesson is that the system actually held. It was put under great stress, but it didn't break apart. And that's exactly what happened, of course, in the interwar years. And I think Britain leaving the European Union won't massively affect this. Even the most ardent Brexiteer imagines some integration between Britain and the WTO or bilateral trade deals or other forums of governance or institutionalization, sometimes sort of dreams of a transatlantic federation, quite reminiscent of the type of ideas we had towards the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Who knows, perhaps by 2035, Britain will be back in the EU. That's if the EU, of course, is still there. <laughs> I'm not doing a great job at optimism, am I? But anyway, I'm going to try. I'm going to try harder. <laughs> so on the one hand, I think every state, it's worth remembering, has a strong interest in maintaining rules around global trade, production, and finance. There's no state in the contemporary world looking to generate a new economic system. Up to some kind of level, we're all capitalists now. And the competition is really between what type of forum of governance do you embed capitalist accumulation and development within? Liberal? 
social democratic, various forms of authoritarianism. And I think that logic's also present, by the way, even amongst today's insurgent democratic socialists, who even if they win, are likely to temper capitalist excess through increased regulation and redistribution, democratize capitalism through various forms of public control, and link it more closely to emerging technologies and green politics, hence ideas like a Green New Deal. So where I think we're more likely to see conflict is of this relatively contained kind. I was going to ask people, actually, but uh, now we've got five minutes rather than seven, I, I won't, about uh, whether they knew who the two largest employers in the world are. Well, go ahead, Banish. <laughs> Do you know? The Chinese Army and Indian Railways. The Chinese, the PLA is one. Now we're opening up. Does anyone else want to guess? Yeah. The NHS? NHS is number five. Look at this, I feel like I'm a game show host. All right, we've got number five, we've got number two. Anyone want to do number one? Uh, LSE. <laughs> I wish. Not even close. It's the US Department of Defense. So the point wanted to be US Department of Defense number one, the PLA number two, then you get Walmart, McDonald's, and the NHS, which I'm sure tells you something about the state of the world, I'm not sure what. But I wanted to focus on one and two there. Nationalism and populism could clearly become more assertive. Few states in East and Northeast Asia, for example, are particularly looking forward to increased Chinese hegemony, at least preferably uh, to a Western-backed or US-backed international order. And there's obviously lots of pinch points that have the potential to get nasty. Kashmir, Taiwan, North Korea, Iran. I nearly said South London, but that's just a glib North London joke. But I think the conflicts in Venezuela and Syria tell you something about how this world might look with the shifting alliances between the West on the one hand, and various coalitions of non-Western states on the other. That may be something that, to get used to in a more plural order. So one thing I think we're going to have to get used to is a world without superpowers. The argument is that superpowers uh, emerge from a world of radically differentiated power, where one or two states are far more powerful than others, their competitors and their allies, and a world of decentered globalism, I think, won't have that differential. It will have several great powers, many regional powers, but no superpowers. So what does that mean for collective security? I think it depends hugely on where you are. You know, if you're in Russia's backyard, if you're Ukraine, if you're the Baltic states, you probably feel relatively uneasy about that. I think if you're in the Americas, for example, I remember a bit of, uh, you're probably quite ambivalent. I remember a bit of graffiti I saw in Chile one time. Uh, Americans go home, Yankee go home, but take me with you. And there's something about that kind of ambivalence that I think is probably more broadly felt among many parts of the world. So I won't do a sort of tour de horizon, but you might want to think about where in the world you are. I think it tells you a lot about whether you'll feel more or less secure. So to conclude, the key thing we're going to have to get used to is a world with this one big pattern, the shift from centered globalism to decentered globalism, and then these two countervailing dynamics, intensification of global interactions and interdependencies on the one hand, and on the other hand, increased pluralism. Although there are many rules, norms, and institutions in the contemporary world that states agree upon, these rules, norms, and institutions are going to be much less underpinned by Western power than they have been over the past century or two. And whether you think that's a good or bad thing, whether you're optimistic or pessimistic, strikes me as resting on two different factors. First, where you sit around the world, and secondly, whether you think there are GPS systems this is my navigator sunglasses, forms of navigation that are going to help to sustain international order in this world of decentered globalism. So I'll leave it there, Manish. Good. Okay. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Um, so I'm here to talk about the future of our planet and sustainability. Uh, here's the worst case scenario. I don't think I have to dwell too long here. Uh, about seven months ago, the United Nations published a climate change report that said we have 12 years to secure acceptable living conditions for the planet. 12 years. So that means that if we don't get our act together at 2035, will already be a few years into a world that is flooded here, in flames there, dried out and degraded, food insecure, and riven by conflicts over resources that we once took for granted. 
poorer, hotter, inhabited by fewer and fewer insect, plant, and animal species. Now, as someone who studies climate change, this wasn't exactly news to me. But about seven months ago, actually, around the same time that this 12-year warning first splashed up on the pages of our newspapers, I also saw, for the first time, the first image of my first child. So when I read those headlines, I was in this place of having very recently had to wrestle with my own optimism and my pessimism. I had had to ask myself, with these expectations, could I really justify intellectually, morally, emotionally, bringing new life onto this suffering planet if this pessimistic vision, this worst case scenario, is our most likely trajectory. So I suppose you figure that I concluded we'll get there. <laughs> uh, we'll avoid the worst of it. We're headed for a best case scenario where we make this 12 year deadline because here I am very visibly pregnant. <laughs> Uh, perhaps you're expecting to hear the, the best case scenario that cites our species track record of technological ingenuity, the idea that we'll innovate our way clean, or that the increasing uptake of sustainability thinking by governments and firms has put win-wins for people and planet within reach. And even if you're not expecting that, perhaps you're hoping for it because we don't like our pregnant women to be pessimists. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't compute. After all, what are we to the broader culture? if not the walking embodiment of our shared desperate faith that tomorrow will be better than today, <laughs> that we can commit to seeing through another generation of humans in the comfort that the world will be able to sustain them. So indeed, I did come down uh, with reasons to be optimistic, but not on the basis of the kind of common bill of goods that we usually get when we talk about best case scenarios of sustainability. If you wanted that story, you invited the wrong pregnant lady. Um, because here's how I see our future. Our climate change future is a future of loss. In fact, our climate change present is a present of loss. In recent work, I've argued that this is we, we as social scientists, we as a public, have to contend with. The depletion of our natural world, the destruction of our cities, the disappearance of not only the ground beneath our feet, but also of the stable meanings that frame our lives and that root our senses of identity and belonging. And these are things that are already happening. Which means, I think, that we have to stop framing our best case scenarios around what can or should be sustained and grapple instead with questions about what does, will, or must disappear. This requires us to, dis to confront the discomfort of having less of the things that we have long wanted Less money at the household level when families have to spend more on disaster recovery. Less money at the national level when the productivity of industries declines. Less biodiversity, fewer species cohabiting the planet with us. And it also requires us to confront the problem of losing things that cannot be counted. The disappearance of ways of life, landscapes, places, and cultures, which can be memorialized but not recovered, recouped, or compensated. But here's the thing. While I acknowledge that thinking in terms of loss is considerably less sunny than looking out <clears throat> always for sustainability, I argue that facing loss, relinquishing the premise that things are or will be OK, is not the same as catastrophism. I actually think that best case and worst case scenario thinking doesn't serve us particularly well when it comes to climate change. Because while we do have to mourn, we don't have to consign ourselves to oblivion for two reasons. So the first reason is that we will lose, but we can also let go. Sustainability, it seems to me, is often about trying to hang on to some measure of our destructive and unequal abundance. And when I say our, I'm talking about those of us living privileged lives in privileged places. So social science has shown us that consumption-centered lives, financed largely on credit and lived in busyness-glorifying cultures, have made most in the rich world unhappy, time-pressed, socially isolated, and stressed out. Rates of depression have gone up for adults in the highest annual household income group. Money and work are the most common reasons given for stress. 
And from social science, we also know that the more we work, the higher, the larger our ecological footprint. If we aspire to have less, to work less, if we lose the entrenched practices of working to earn and earning to consume, we may have lost something that was never worth having to begin with. There are elements of our way of life that we may want to surrender. The second way to find optimism in loss is through the fact that loss connects us to one another. We are all vulnerable to loss. In the context of climate change, social scientists have rightly problematized this vulnerability, particularly its uneven distributions along lines of gender and race and class and region. But vulnerability is also constitutive of our humanity. Every child struggles. My child will struggle. But my optimism, if you want to call it that, lies in the fact that the shared experience of loss is something that empathically links us. We often respond with sensitivity and generosity, with acts of care to the losses of others. And this openness to others and to a volatile world is also what makes humans adaptable. It makes us capable of living with the loss of things, places, people, and ways of life that we treasure. And I think, I hope, capable of losing in order to transform into something else. The kids get it. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming, and um, welcome to my conversation about algorithms, artificial intelligence, and technologies of tyranny and or justice. Um, my name, again, is Sita Penyagangadaran. I teach in the Media and Communications Department. And I want to take this opportunity um, to have a slightly interactive conversation with you. So I'm going to take you through the worst case scenario with um, an admission, which is to say, I'm actually a serial optimist. And I often feel like we come to these conversations thinking about technologies of control, thinking about ways in which we live, as Shoshana Zuboff would say, under surveillance capitalism, the ways in which um, we're driven by the data economy or the ways that we are targeted. We, we seek these sort of dystopian narratives, um, maybe in part to motivate us to do something differently. Um, but I want to. I want to get us to a place where we're actually thinking in um, a more generative manner. It doesn't necessarily have to be optimistic, but I hope it's a way in which we might collectively think about collectively self-determining our technologically mediated lives. So for the worst case scenario, I chose um, this technology. Does anybody actually know what this is? Or can guess? Yeah. Yes. Great. You've made my five minutes much more effective. <laughs> so this is um, an ankle bracelet for um, people under house arrest. I chose this example partly because I come uh, from the United States. And I often work at the intersection of technology and social justice. And for people in the criminal justice system, there's a tremendous amount of concern about these kinds of technologies of tyranny, technologies of control. Why is that? Well, in the United States, there are approximately 31 million individuals who are in the criminal justice system, who are in the carceral state. The United States is known for being a place of mass incarceration. As Michelle Alexander would call it, it's the new Jim Crow. And so I put this up here because in 2035, though this is a technology that might be targeted towards incarcerated individuals today, this kind of technology in 2035 might actually be the technologies for all of us, whether or not we're 
marginalized or members of marginalized communities, black and brown communities that are over-policed and over-surveilled, but also for those of us who are privileged and everyone in between, right? We can imagine this kind of GPS device fencing us in, not only for the purposes of state control, whether that has to do with how welfare services are allocated towards us, whether or not we're eligible to that, to, in, with those services, um, but also uh, technologies of tyranny that pertain to the marketplace, right? We are already seeing this with differential pricing technologies and the type of electronic fencing that takes place. As you walk into a particular location, your phone is signaling to data brokers that you're here proximal to certain kinds of uh, social patterns in buying or economic patterns and therefore targeted for particular types of products or particular types of prices. So we can imagine a future in 2035 where we're actually targeted even more effectively, profiled even more effectively. And so what I fear is happening or could happen in this worst case scenario is that the technology companies, which are ever increasing, right, economies of scale and networked economies teach us that um, the bigger the technology company, the more effective it is in providing a service. So we might be very well headed towards a future where big tech is designing technologies that rob us of our ability to make choices, rob us of our ability to self-determine, to choose the way in which we want to be and what we want to do. And again, I base this scenario, this worst case scenario, on a technology that is already existing within certain communities. So I think that's really important for thinking about how we imagine our futures, right? For some people, this is already a reality. And it's not just the ankle um, bracelet. It's not just home uh, house arrest devices. It's a whole host of technologies that integrate with systems of oppression and domination. Now, again, we could spend so much time walking through these pessimistic scenarios of technology. And there's a lot already in the public discourse that has us thinking about the ways in which we might already be controlled, already subject to tyranny. So I just want to pause here and, or switch here to ask the audience, how many people are on social media? Raise your hand. So I just want you to look around. Sorry. I just want you to look around. Now, keep your hand up if you've ever deleted your account. <laughs> deleted your account. Put your hand up now. So that's about maybe one third of the room. I want you to put your hand up if you've never been on social media. <laughs> okay, that's about 15, no, maybe 20 people in a room full of, I don't know, 200 ish. Slight like age bias in this <laughs> as well. I'm 45, I've never been on Facebook. It's a coming out. Um, so <laughs> I want you to now think, why is it that we don't wean ourselves off of technologies with which we might have a problem, right? Which, with which we might think, oh, there's something about this technology or these technologies that are controlling, that are profiling, that are surveilling me, that are treating me as a data point and not as who I am or who I want to be, right? 
why is it that we don't delete our accounts or think about refusing technologies more often? And I've thought about this a lot in conjunction and in collaboration with community organizers, mainly in the United States, um, who are thinking about, and this is my term, not necessarily theirs, technologies of justice, right? And by that term, I don't mean inventing or innovating particular technical systems. I'm talking about socio-technical infrastructures relationships between people in light of technologies and the ways that they connect or disconnect us, and making choices about how we coexist, how we collectively decide on problems, how we enjoy our lives and prosper. And so I present a scenario in 2035 where there is already an active discourse on technologies of justice that, again, aren't about a particular device or a particular type of neural network that will decide for us on the basis of all sorts of ambient data that we produce, but technologies of justice that are premised as my collaborators in Detroit, the Detroit Community Technology Project and the digital, D Detroit Digital Justice Coalition would say, that are premised on values of equal access, meaningful participation, common ownership, and healthy communities. So I challenge you to think about what it would take for you to actually get to that point of refusal of technological systems by the terms and conditions that were offered, and instead thinking about just and equitable socio-technical support systems that can serve our just and democratic societies. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. I am Liam Kofi Bright from the philosophy department, and I'm a social epistemologist. What that means is I study how it is that uh, groups reason together, how we share information, share beliefs, share, um, share knowledge, and how that allows us to make better or worse decisions um, going forward. So for me, one of the sort of the big notable changes about the recent world is the advent of social media, as was just ably demonstrated by the previous speaker that was no way planned, that was pretty great. Um, and so, think about like, what kind of potential this has for affecting how we interact qua knowledge generators and sharers, and whether this might lead to a, a good or bad outcomes for us, is what I'm gonna focus on. Right, so first my pessimistic scenario. I call it the Blade Runner scenario, that's Blade Runner, you can't really see it. Also, I have made no effort to get any kind of copyright licensing for that image. Uh, I'm just counting on the LSE lawyers to have my back. So, hey director. Um, so, um, so, in the 1950s, uh, I think it was the mid 20th century, I'm gonna blank on the date, um, what was called the tobacco strategy was invented by the tobacco industry. This is a situation where increasingly research was coming out linking um, smoking to lung cancer and very bad health outcomes for people who smoked. And sort of direct lies trying to negate this from tobacco companies was quickly seen as not credible. And so that wasn't the best means by which to fight this. But obviously tobacco companies still want to sell cigarettes. What do they do? Well, here's what they did. They relied on the fact that in the course of scientific investigation, of course, results were always mixed. The evidence never strictly just points in one direction. Initially, as we explore things, data can support multiple conclusions. And what they would do is they would 
find that, that any study which seemed to go their way, which seemed to break the link between smoking and cancer, and just signal boost that massively. They'd produce a pamphlet, they'd send that out to doctors, they'd send that out to media organizations, in the hope that they could rely on your trust of scientists as information producers to sort of, and if they got people who are sort of influential, influential nodes in information transmission, especially relative, relative to health outcomes, doctors, media organizations, they could sort of spread things which were hard to dismiss as just straightforward lies, but which would be a sort of very misleading picture of the evidential state overall. Now that was way before anything like contemporary social media and the internet. But my pessimistic outcome is things we're already seeing, which is something like that process gets exacerbated, where bad agents um, find ways of taking advantage of our habits of trusting each other, our habits of interacting with our friends on a, on a sort of trusting basis, and so taking their advice on board, such that if they can just get one person in a network of friends that mis to spread some kind of lie, some kind of misinformation, something misleading, that malinformation can spread very quickly and very rapidly throughout a, a node, throughout a network of people connected via social media. Now, not only is that bad in itself, but I think sort of but what's distinctive about the Blade Runner world is how sort of totally cynical everything has become. And I think that if I look forward to that trend being projected um, into the future, what I imagine is a world in which we've all lost the ability to trust each other. Eventually, this just breaks down our habit of interacting with each other as trusting peers at all, as we're all aware that we're vulnerable to this kind of abuse, to this kind of abuse of our habits of trust. But we don't know how to combat it. And the only retreat available to us is simply to stop, stop trusting people altogether. And so in the bad world, we've become sort of cut off from human connection because we can't distinguish the trustworthy from the untrustworthy and, because, and there are always going to be bad agents incentivized to make that terrible for us. So that's the bad future, total cynicism and the loss of human trust and human connection. How about the good world? Um, so um, this, is, this is the Star Trek world. And I, I guess like, if you have to sort of be honest about what your values are, and if anyone knows the, the show Star Trek, this tells you what I think the good world would look like. Um, but he, here's another feature of social media. And it connects us to people who we have no means of, sort of actually getting to know in any face-to-face -face way. So during the recent um, conflict, the tensions between India and Pakistan, I found myself in communication with people I only really know through Twitter um, who are in India, in fact, in the regions affected, and stood to be sort of very badly hurt if things went even worse than they did. And, you know, I, I cared. I cared on an emotional level more than just my abstract concern for peace, my concern for peace amongst peoples. Um, and what I think social media has the potential to do is make sort of the ancient dream of the cosmopolis real. So there's an old dream in philosophy, and you can find it in Western philosophy amongst the Stoics, in a Chinese philosophy, if one knows it, amongst uh, Moza and the, the Moists, of building a sort of a universal community of humanity. And a problem for that has always been just limitations of, of time and technology um, don't allow for the some of the necessary basis of a real communal relationships to exist amongst us. And this is a, a tradition from, from Hegel, actually, which says that what you need to have a community is effective relationships. You need to care for each other. You need to have some kind of... Um, that what goes on for other people in your community needs to be emotionally significant to you, needs to be salient, you need to care for them. And social media makes that possible because while I can't be everywhere at once, while I can't fly out and get to know people on a one-to-one -one basis, somehow it brings them closer to me and I can form concerns for them, they, I can relate to them as people. And so the good trend would just be that that continues, that we all come to see each other as not just sort of abstract people, but the persons that one cares for and one wishes the best for, and starts to try to design communities and institutions on a global scale which reflect that effective relationship to people. So that's the good case. So, so which of those do I think is more likely? Um, I think a lot will depend on how we change not just regulatory structures and not just technological um, advances, but also how we change our norms of interacting, how we like, respond to the fact that a 
there are these bad agents out there trying to manipulate us. And if we can find a way to do that without losing our faith in one another, I think we can end up in Picard world rather than world of that character who I don't know, but he has that tears and rain speech. It's very good. Um, okay, so there are my seven minutes up. Um, I hope we live in the world of happy human relations rather than cynical mistrust of everything. Uh, thank you for being here. All right. My name is Ilka Gleibs. I'm an assistant professor in social psychology. And uh, I wasn't so well prepared. And then people talk uh, about their lives and their relatives. So I thought I'd also share an anecdote with you or an fact. So Rebecca talked about her new child. And I wanted to talk about my grandmother. So this is um, something my grandmother gave me. And my grandmother was born about 100 years ago. She passed away a few years ago. And she was a very um, simple woman living in East Frisia in northwest Germany. She always lived in the same village. She never really traveled. I think she traveled once to Chicago. That was very exciting. But um, <laughs> she didn't speak any other languages but uh, Pladeutsch, so lower Germany, and German, so it's a dialect. So what I want to say is like, she was in her village, and she had her so close social relations with people. She's met her whole life. And here I am in London, in the middle of this capital, as an assistant professor at the LSE. And I have met so many different people, even in this room, even today, which I think is amazing and shows how much progress we made in the last 100 years in terms of connecting who we are and who we interact with. So I think we can start with a relatively optimistic view that a lot of positive things happened in the last 100 years. But we are also maybe at a point where this could tip, right? So on the one hand, we have um, this pull to fragmentation. The progress of the past decade is historic. It connects people, empowers individuals, groups, and states, and actually has lifted billions out of poverty in this process. But at the same time, this progress also has been shocks like the global a financial crisis that we already talked about today, and the global rise of populist anti-establishment politics and creating new inequalities. So on the one hand, this achievement of the industrial and informational ages are shaping a world that comes together, like us today in this room, and kind of enriches us and gives us many opportunities that my grandmother never had. But on the other hand, it became a place that might become more dangerous, where we have more fragmentation. People are again retrieving to their local identities. So whether the promise of um, the promise or the peril prevails, this is something. This is our choice as human mankind, and this is what we already discussed today. So which way are we going? Which direction do we take? So if we take maybe the the less optimistic way, so we stay on the left side of this picture, we might have the rise of more and more exclusionary identities. A more interconnected world, world will continue to increase that rather than reduce differences over ideas and identities. Populism will increase over the next two decades and more, um, especially if current demographic and economic and governments trends hold. So, too, will these exclusionary national and religious identities as the interplay between technology and culture accelerates and people seek meaning and security in context of rapid and disorienting economic, social, and technological changes. So people will go into their little corner of the world and their, their mental corner, the groups, the echo chambers they live in. Um, similar, similarly, identity groups will become more influential. Political le leaders will find appeals <coughs> to identity useful for mobilizing supporters and consolidating political order by excluding those who they think don't fit. A key near-term implication of this rising identity politics might be the erosion of traditions of tolerance and diversity associated with um, maybe the Western world as we thought it <coughs> could be threatening the global appeal of these ideas as well. Other key implications could explicitly use nationalism as threatening characteriz characterizations of the West 
to shore up authorit more authoritarian control in other parts of the world like China or Russia and might inflame identity conflicts and communal tensions in Africa, the Middle East, or South Asia. Anti-immigration and xenophobic sentiments among core dem democracies like the United States or the UK or even Germany uh, strengthens the cultivating, um, might derode the diverse societies and harnessing global, or will kind of push global talent away. And similarly, similarity, exclusionary religious identity might shape re regional and local dynamics in the Middle East, in North Africa, and um, might threaten to do so in parts of the Sub-Saharan Africa between Christians and Muslims, to just give one example. So I think this is my pessimistic view. We become more and more fragmented. We go more and more back to our very local, very nationalistic identities and we exclude all of those people that we think don't fit in those very strict categories. However, on the more optimistic side, we can also see that prejudice both implicitly, so this is just some recent social psychological research so show that implicit and explicit prejudice reduce over time, and this trend is increasing, and the fourth card is that negative attitudes towards other people are decreasing. We also know that there might be a generational shift, right? So the millennials are generally um, less prejudiced than previous generations. Younger people also voted less exclusionary. The UK, for example, in the UK, the majority of people under 45 backed Remain. And younger people were also less likely to vote for Trump, for example. So what does it mean? The good news is that the millennials, so those born between 1980 and 2000, will peak in terms of job and places of influence around 2030, 2040, so in 2035. They will be taking over jobs in government, in leadership, and so on. So if these people who might be less prejudiced and less focused on these exclusionary identities are in positions of power, maybe that means that we won't shift towards this very exclusionary world. These people are less identified um, as part in terms of partisan parties, for example, so they are more independent, they vote generally more liberal, and that if the trends continue, we will see less prejudice and less attached people to specific ethnic, religious, or national groups in these previous generations. Uh, the millennials are generally also the most diverse population we have seen so far. So there won't be a very, or at least in the Western world, in the US, in the UK, in uh, large parts, parts, parts of Europe, there won't be a clear majority anymore. There won't be a clear white majority anymore. So which also might mean that people cannot retrieve into this very exclusionary identity corners. Um, the other good news might be that there is some sort of trans trans intergenerational transmission. So if I have parents who are less prejudiced, the children will also be less prejudiced. And so if these millennials, so I put a lot of hope in the millennials, and I'm, just, <laughs> I'm not a millennial anymore. I'm just out of that category. So I, I place the hope to other people. But um, so I think if my generation, the generation just after me, is less prejudiced, and we know from research there are these intergenerational transmission processes, we also might see that that will lead to even more um, upcoming, in, or more people believing that diversity is something that we should strive for. Um, so I put a lot of hope in a generational shift, in, a sh in, in the belief that we are at this split second, but we were a relatively, it's a relatively 50-50 decision, and we just need this tiny little push towards um, maybe a less, uh, less pessimistic view. Um, and I think I also wanted to mention what you talked about, the technologies, because I think another element of identity is that more and more people have this online identities are connected to people all over the world, which can be, as we heard, a force for good if we do the right thing with it. 
So thank you very much. Good evening. Does this work? Yes. I'm Barbara Fasolo, and I'm a decision scientist. So for uh, these five, seven minutes, I'll try an exercise which I normally teach because it helps in forecasting exercises, which we're really not very good at normally. That's who I am. I'm Barbara Fasolo. <laughs> so I'll ask you to join me on this decision time machine. It's a new prototype which I've just uh, finished to design with my colleagues, Valentina Ferretti and Umar Taj, who are right there. It's designed to study not what we decide, but how we make decisions. How they made decisions normally around the world and uh, in different areas. But for tonight, it's been programmed to just travel to 2035. And we're not going to go far. It's still London but we'll go out of a new academic building. So the uh, time machine has two buttons, a worst case button, conveniently large and black, <laughs> and a best case uh, button, which is conveniently large and green. Now we'll travel to a worst case scenario first, because that's been the pattern here. Now when I push the button, I need your word that you will close your eyes. <laughs> and normally in my classroom, I can really detect who doesn't close the eyes. I close the eyes and I'll count down from three to one. And when we're one, please open your eyes because we're there. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Three, two, one. Open your eyes. We are outside. We're actually on Piccadilly. There are very few people around. Those that you actually see around do not notice you. They look frail. They look pale. They look withdrawn, clearly unwell. They make no eye contact. And we start to actually wonder if we do have a body because they really do not show any emotion when you're close to them. We notice, though, that they have a device. We don't recognize what it is, but they do show spikes of activity pretty frantic uh, as, they, as they get to interact with this device. And I find one on the pavement, so I pick it up, and it does remind me a bit of a device that we used to have in 2019 called Alexa. Uh, <laughs> the first time I saw it at my friend's housewarming party, Laura, who's here, and I tried to get Alexa to play a song that I like a lot, uh, but it didn't because obviously it wasn't trained on my voice. The uh, song that I wanted desperately to play is a song by the English rock band The Clash that I like a lot and I use a lot in my teaching because it's about a decision. Should I stay or should I go? <laughs> and um, <laughs> my students know it. And as I think these words, actually the device vibrates and tells me, this is how you apply for the chief brain machine officer position at Neuralink. So yes, this device has actually made the key strategic decision that I need to make for my next step in my career, a tyrannical tool, as Sita said. So then I realize that actually the planet is affected by algorithmic addiction and addiction-induced decision apathy. This is an epidemic that actually gets to consume our bodies, switches off, the part of the brain that is uh, proposed to decision autonomy and gradually shuts down all our vital um, functions and ultimately death. <laughs> so quickly, let's go back to 2019. And we're back. Relief. So good to have the ATLC with a human director <laughs> right there. And already 2019 looks pretty good, uh, but we need to go to the best case scenario. So as before, please close your eyes. I'm going to count down from three to one, and at one, we're there. Ready? Three, two, one. 
we're there. We're again in Piccadilly. But wow, the scene has changed. There are many people around. People are engaged with one another, they're in groups. And we're immediately approached by a group of teenagers. They look at us, they have a smile. They look at us in their eyes and they, the look is warm. They hand us a gift and they tell us excited, it's a decision tool which they received for free at school when they completed the new mandatory program in decision making education that is rolled out <laughs> nationwide. They show us excited the three features that this tool allows and they use the most. And the first is a deep empathy video camera. It's one that allows you to see the world through the eyes of people that are in very different circumstances from us, normally pretty awful, and the brain shuts down for those. The second is a decision buddy chat. That is for helping others make better decisions because we're pretty pathetic at doing our own, but we're better at helping others make decisions. The last is a why alarm. That sets off automatically just before we have to make that big decision to really reconnect to our deep values that we tend to forget, at least half of them, in the heat of the moment. But again, we have to go back to 2019 and we give back the tool because otherwise it's never developed. So we're back. Um, time is running out. Um, I need to say that both scenarios have been inspired by real research that has been conducted in the lab or the field or online, and you get the references at the bottom because I'm really a boring academic. But there's one thing <laughs> that I'm really, really passionate about, and it's really aligned to the spirit of this festival, so I'm going to share it with you, which is a deep empathy project um, where I'm involved. It's mainly based at MIT. It involves a, um, a deep learning uh, experts, machine learning experts, and here's an example. So this is Piccadilly, yes, it's Piccadilly in the old Bond Street, but as you see, the image morphs, and over a few seconds, what you can see is a familiar neighborhood, how that's transformed if it's devastated, like uh, the Syrian city of Homs in this particular case. And what we found in the, uh, in the research is that exposed just for a few seconds to images like this of familiar surroundings that are completely, utterly changed, people actually feel closer to victims, to refugees. Now, our next step is to figure out how to translate that change in feelings in a change in action, uh, in actual decision making in humanitarian settings, but that's really hopeful. So with that, I think this is a really first steady concrete step towards the future with a big E, E for engagement, empathy, education, and yes, equality maybe. So thank you very much for playing along. Are you all back? Huh? Thank you for those absolutely wonderful and thought-provoking presentations. So what I thought I'd start with is we've got some interesting input from social media which resonates with aspects of each of your presentations. And I've got two pessimistic pieces of input from LinkedIn and Facebook. And I've got two, oh, I'm so sorry, the, the optimistic ones come from LinkedIn and Facebook and the pessimistic ones come from Twitter. <laughs> Observation. Interestingly enough, we had the same pattern in the first session. The Twitter users were always more pessimistic. And I'm going to read them, I'm going to read snippets out and just go round each of you and ask you to react to that aspect which is relevant to your area. But I think there's something here for everyone. So let me start with the, let me start with the pessimistic ones since that's where everyone started. Uh, and I'm just going to read the quotes. First one, nations around the world are in year-round drought. India suffers catastrophic aquifer failure. 100 million climate refugees, the world's largest famine follows. One. Second one, civil war across cultural lines ending in resounding victory for robots. <laughs> okay, let me turn to my two optimistic ones. I'm optimistic the dystopian rhetoric needs to stop. Painting a hopeless picture is not a good way of mobilizing people or getting them to make change. 
climate change should be framed as a solvable problem because that's exactly what it is, and approaching a challenging problem without having a fixed opinion on its solution. And then final optimistic one, extensive and frequent opportunities for people from different cultures, communities, and countries to work together will most probably help humans achieve far greater understanding among each other and can be a great tool in that direction. Future challenges can't be handled at our individual national identity level as future challenges will not ask for your passport when they will impact you. Okay, so maybe I'll start on this end. Or oh, actually, uh, yes, I'll start on that end and just react to either the pessimistic or the optimistic comments. I, I guess I'll react to the optimistic ones, um, partly because they resonate with me. Um, I do agree that, um, I mean, I, I kind of said it in my remarks, right, that often um, when people talk about technology in particular, uh, people go for the dystopian story, right? It's something that we, we sort of search for and we expect. And it's much harder to talk about the things that we do want and the change that we might be able to make and the ways in which we might be able to transform with respect to whether it's um, universal humanity or inclusive identities or thinking about empathy or thinking about what it is that we can give up and not um, have a disabling sense of loss. Like these are really important um, questions to be asking and a, a, a framework to be embracing in order that we can achieve some form of societal transformation. So that, that question or comment really resonates with me. And um, I think I'll just say, I'll speak for myself as an academic, my experience in the academy is that often um, we hear a lot of gloom and doom, right? There's so much gloom and doom and um, not enough of thinking about the normative conditions under which we might be able to succeed and thrive and again prosper and enjoy our lives and enjoy the world in which we live. And so I, I think we could absolutely do more of that and probably it requires us thinking beyond our epistemic communities and connecting with those who are speaking a different kind of language um, in terms of societal transformation. Okay, thank you, Sita. Rebecca. Sure. Um, oh, yes. Oh. Maybe I get a bit closer to the mics. Okay. Um, right, so climate change should be presented as a solvable problem. I certainly don't disagree with that. Um, I think that's, that's not just a question of kind of tactics or messaging. I think it's an empirical problem. In other words, I don't think we've actually moved the needle on solving climate change because we haven't also been talking about things like redistribution and equity and social provision um, and these kind of bigger things that I think we have to contend with that kind of cut to the core of the way social life is organized currently and it's organized in a way that is kind of ecologically unsustainable. Um, so yeah, I, I certainly, I, that, that idea certainly resonates with me, but I think it's, you know, when, when people say that the messaging on, on climate change is too negative, I think it's because the, the kind of techno-optimist version that we normally get you know, hasn't actually dealt with a lot of the interlinked problems that people face when they are facing conditions of climate change. Okay. George. Just something on the, um, uh, the interaction of people. I mean, I, again, I agree. Uh, I think we largely find, largely find at least, that when you have areas and you have societies where people are as mixed as possible from around the world or from <laughs> a very different uh, backgrounds and so on, then actually they tend to get on better. However, that's usually in the long term. So what you often have to do is ride out these sort of short-term political spasms that that deep uh, interaction often brings. And that just means you have to do politics and you have to do uh, politics really well. And I think that's a couple of things that we need to think about very carefully uh, in today's climate and also going forward is what type of political order, what type of leadership, what type of institutions do we construct that allow us to think more long term or at least ride out these political storms when they arise so that we can get the benefits of that type of much more mixed social order. Uh, just one uh, 
other point on that, which links to something that Barbara was saying. That's an extremely uh, sort of maximalist vision, the deep empathy vision of what that type of integrated order could look like, and I'm all for that. But I have to say at the moment, I'd set off for something a bit more minimalist. I'd set off for us tolerating each other and getting on with each other. Because once you unleash some of these categories, we've been here before in 19th, 20th century, large moments like this, that actually unleash these terrible forms of politics. Sometimes there's something, so it's a very British answer compared to the Italian art. You know? There's something to be said for a bit of repression, you know, for a bit of tolerance, for a bit of sort of institutionalization. Just a bit, of, you know, something that actually sort of mediates uh, these forms of difference and can actually help us, as I said, get to that long-term time horizon where I think things are absolutely uh, more progressive uh, the more mixed we are. Okay, Liam. Um, uh, so I guess two things. First, I just, I am an avid Twitter user, and I just want to say it does not surprise me that the pessimistic answers from Twitter. Twitter is for irony and sadness, and that's the only <laughs> thing. Very interesting pattern, actually. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. So the the main, more substantial thing I'd like to respond to was the thought in that um, civil war along cultural lines, victory to the robots. Um, while I think we will heroically resist our robot overlords, um, on the civil war on culture lines, I, I think it's kind of the, f the flip side of the, some of the things I was talking about in my optimistic scenario, um, where if we don't have that, if instead we're in the cynical world, so I guess the flip side of my optimistic scenario is my pessimistic scenario, if we're in the cynical world where we no longer know what to trust in terms of the normal means of identifying people as friends or reliable information sources, I imagine that what we'll do then is we'll have to go with very crude markers of just on my, on my side, like, we'll fight with me. Because we can't really be totally atomized. We rely on one another. The, the world is always, and it has been for a very long time, far too interconnected for any of us to go it alone. And so I do think that um, we have to be careful that if we, if we lose access to shared, um, shared um, intercommunal sources of information and knowledge exchange, then what we'll do is retreat into the, the crudest cultural markers of sameness, and they will be axes along which we can organize for war rather than peace. And so, so I, I can see that's a real fear, which I think should be avoided by some of the means which our people are discussing here. Okay. Ilka. Yeah, I think going back to the robots, um, this could also be quite useful for humans because uh, as humans, we tend to to categorize the world into in-groups and out-groups, so people who are with us and people who are against us. And I think what I talked about is this, uh, one, the pessimistic scenario is that these in-groups become smaller and smaller and smaller. And a more optimistic one would be that they become larger and larger and larger, and we include more and more people into those. And if we start a war with the robots, then all the humans will be in one in-group. So <laughs> um, that would be good to yeah. have this common enemy. <laughs> the, the watchmen scenario. Yeah. <laughs> but the same is true for climate change, because I think we need, and, and we need to have this inclusive view of human, humankind, and maybe even going beyond humankind, to tackle climate change, because we cannot tackle that if we retreat into our own small local communities, because it is a global challenge. So that, I think there's also a necessity to, not just because we want to do kumbaya and we're all happy and together, no, because we cannot tackle our actual challenges, which is, I think, climate change is one of the most pressing things we have to tackle. We, if we think about oh, only the English in one part of the island and only the people who voted Trump. And no, we have to think about it as something that goes beyond uh, national, nation states. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Barbara. I'll just make, uh, can you hear me from here? Um, I'll just make a general comment about the, um, the tweets. It reminds me of a theme of the first uh, evening or opening event of a pessimism bias, in a way, because we do tend, our brain tends to really stick to the negative news, to the negative, particularly when they're broadcasted and it's in the media all over the place. And those two things are um, called availability bias, pessimism bias, and these are things that we do 
all over the place. It doesn't have to be about climate change. It happens everywhere. So I think what's really important is just to educate people against biases. That's it. It's just an application in the context of climate change or other issues. Okay. Very good. I think now it's time to open it up to the audience and get thoughts and comments from, uh, from, from you. If you could introduce yourself and ask a question that's preferably brief. So I'm going to start with the gentleman here, and then the gentleman here, and the woman here. Um, Barbara, thank you. Well, thank you all for your talks. Um, so Barbara, you mentioned in your, uh, in your sort of optimistic world, uh, deep empathy in technological systems. Mm -hmm. And as someone that writes algorithms and technological systems, and for the growing number of technologists out there, what kind of advice can you give uh, to all of us to improve our systems and make them more empathetic, uh, to consider so that people don't just become another data point. Okay. I'm going to take the, a batch yeah, of questions, if that's all right. Uh, gentleman here, I believe. Uh, yes, I'm Colin Becks. I'm a, a politician um, of a new sort, um, even though it's been going for 45 years, trying to get a total restructuring of our existing uh, decadent, uh, post-imperial, uh, top-down diktat uh, of nation states. Uh, I disagree with the speaker who said that uh, global problems can't be solved locally. On the contrary, like it or not, each one of us is a unique and unique human being. We all have our own thoughts and ideas and angles and that is what provides the diversity out of which only can we solve local problems. Global organizations will never be able to distinguish the differences so critical to each and every one of our lives. So I'm asking if anyone would like to comment on this, would they agree with me it's time to throw out the nation state diktat world uh, conglomer agglomeration and replace it with regional parliaments with bottom-up control. Okay, advocate for decentralization and the, the woman behind that. Right, um, I despair that racism is still being conflated with um, Brexit and populism. As a six-year-old, I grew up in working-class America during the Vietnam War, I'm half Taiwanese. So I think I know a thing or two about racism. And as a child, I knew the difference between somebody who, an adult that would take me to the side and protect me quietly, and those that would use me as a pro poster child loudly and actually fuel more trouble for me on the playground. And I feel with all due respect to the penultimate speaker, I think there were a lot of conflations of uh, issues like racism with Brexit and populism, which I think the elephant in the room, which a lot of people aren't seeing, is the first speaker talked about deglobalization. And these things are symbols of what's coming based on peer, -to -peer technology. The internet has made it possible that uh, top-down superstructures with a single point of failure at the top are dinosaurs in the future is a networked, distributed governance and financial system. I think the populism movement is the most exciting thing to have occurred in my lifetime. Okay, I'll start with Barbara on positive algorithms and then I'll open it up to others on a common set of questions around decentralization and more local power kind of arguments. So two, um, so quick answer, to be able to equip tool and technology to expand empathy oh, or, oh sorry, let me get that to use this, sorry about that. I thought this was working. Um, I think you have to keep an eye on the latest research in, in neuroscience. Uh, I'll give an example. What really we need technology to do is to supplement what our brain cannot possibly do. There was a study that put people in a scanner and they had to imagine themselves in the future, say, at 70, 70 years old. And then they had to imagine a stranger. The same part of the brain lit up 
So how you see yourself in the future is as you see a stranger. And the way they, um, they fixed that was to get people into a lab, get people to accept to have a t picture taken of them, and then they made an avatar of themselves. And they found that just simply by interacting with the avatar, that in one case was the same at the same time, the other case it was aged, people actually connected with the old self, it's still themselves and not other people themselves in the future. So it's a difficulty we really have, not just to empathize with refugees that are just stranded on the beach. It's really with us, with anything that is, is, is not right now, right here. And technology has huge potential to allow us to do that. As long as we interact with it, what's very key is that the image changed. So you really see a change from now, something similar to us to something awful. And that's the key. We need to really capitalize on that. It's really a, a good potential. Okay. Sita and then George, I think. Really quickly, because I think that's a fantastic question, and thank you for posing it. I feel like we don't get that question enough. Um, I'm currently in a debate with computer scientists and engineers about bias and algorithmic decision systems and AI. And um, one of the things that I've question them or pose to them is, can you create some sort of AI system that would end white supremacy? <laughs> and I pose that question partly because it's an absurd question, but it's a real question in that it thinks about a large systematic um, form of oppression and questions whether or not technologies are the appropriate solution to that problem. And I, I, pose, I share that with you partly because sometimes I wonder, what is that point of reflection or reflexivity within the data scientist or the computer scientist or the engineer where maybe there is no technological solution or maybe the question is too big or the problem is too big such that it requires us to think across, again, epistemic communities or with different kinds of problem-solving mechanisms. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I think you're asking the right question. I hope that more, more data scientists will and more designers will ask those questions and consider when technologies shouldn't be developed. George, and then Liam. On the second question, I don't think it's an either or between local and global, I think it's both. And there are some issues that strike me you know, around nuclear proliferation or the taxation of financial accumulation or massive uh, technology companies that strike me as not being particularly local, that you need joined up, integrated uh, units to be able to deal with the type of flows that work at that particular scale. On the other hand, clearly, uh, there's something to decentralization in the terms that it often closely fits people's identities, and that may well... Uh, help them uh, in, uh, towards a form of politics that is meaningful to them. The only thing I would say then is that I think what we need is a multi-scalar politics, partly because we have multi-scalar identities. You know, if I'm in China, I'm European. If I'm in France, I'm British. If I'm in Scotland, I'm English. If I'm in Manchester, I'm from London. If I'm in South London, I'm from North London. If I'm in Camden, I'm from Islington. If I'm in Finsbury Park, I'm from Highbury. And most importantly of all, when I talk to a Tottenham fan, I'm an Arsenal fan. <laughs> And what I really want to talk about is the terrible refereeing at today's derby. That kills the <laughs> but that gets to the point that sometimes I don't want to just deal with other Arsenal fans. I do when I want to complain about referees, but it depends on the type of issue that we're talking about. It depends on the type of politics we're doing. So for me, I wouldn't have this as an either or binary, I think, in terms of multi-scalar politics. Okay. Liam. Um, so I was... Oh. <laughs> um, no, you local. No, you, do, you were I said you can't more. do it top down, you have to do it bottom up. That is not a binary. That is that is how it has to be. And if it doesn't happen that way, there's no hope. Liam, did you wanna Well I was gonna say some pretty similar things that was what was just said. So that's that's pretty annoying. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm a South Londoner, so I was, <laughs> I was gonna come in on you for that before. <laughs> But I'm an Arsenal fan, so I'm going to let it go. Um, um, 
<laughs> but yeah, I, I think in line with sort of the, the two questions at the end here, uh, I, I'm, I think it is, I'm broadly in favor as much as we can of taking advantage of, of local knowledge, of independent decision making, of giving people like empowering individuals and communities to make decisions at the, at the lowest level possible. Um, how, the, what kind of institutional structures we need to achieve that is going to be a difficult problem, and I am a philosopher, so wrong person to ask. But, but the, the thrust, the, the spirit behind it, I just wanted to express some kind of support for that, and that's all I have to say. Okay. Uh, I think we've got time for another round of questions, so take three more. Goodness, uh, now you're all warmed up. Uh, okay, let me take... Uh, I've got two there, the gentleman there and the woman behind him. I'll take the woman here. Oh, let's have another one. Do you mind if we run a little bit late? Uh, let's take those three and I'll do one more round and then I'll, I'll get back to everyone. Hi, um, wonderful conclusion to a tremendous week. Thank you all. A question um, very much in the news for all of you. How do you react to the freedom implications for the recent initiatives pointing towards a cashless society? Cashless. A cashless society. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Woman behind. Hello, I'm Jenny, and I'm from um, uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And uh, the question I'd like to ask is, what controversial um, modern innovations do you think we need to embrace the most in order to try and save the planet? So would that be urbanization, nuclear energy, genetic modification, and geoengineering? Okay, I think that's for you, Rebecca. And there was one more, oh yes, the woman right down here. Sorry, and I forget, yes, and please introduce yourself. You'll do climate, who's gonna do cashless? Thank you. Um, I've been sitting here thinking in 2035, I'm going to be 89. What is the new world order going to be for me? And for other people in their 80s, 90s, we've got an aging population. And um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm not talking about medical advances, meaning that I'm going to live to be 150, but what generally? Yeah. I think everyone kind of pointed to me on cashless society. I want to understand the question. You're referring to, are you referring to digital currencies and, or? or Essentially for convenience of um, some people, for shopkeepers, there are initiatives now banning cash. So ah. Use cards and credit cards. Yes, and yes. Instead of Trojan horse. Yes. If everybody can be monitored, what about the outsiders who don't want every movement? Yes. Yes. So, of course, cash has the beauty of complete anonymity, uh, whereas electronic forms of payment are traceable. And um, this is also one of the appeals of things like Bitcoin, because, again, it comes with anonymity. Um, and why there's a big debate about whether central banks should issue digital currency, because then the state would then <coughs> sort of recoup that knowledge of every transaction going on in the economy. Um, I guess, I think it's an interesting question. I mean, clearly the amount of digital transactions is gone up, has gone up enormously. We all experience that in our lives. And yet the paradox is demand for cash has not fallen very much. So in the UK, demand for cash has been stable. The only country I'm aware of where demand for cash has fallen is in Sweden which has gone very, very digital. I have not seen the data for China because I think China has also gone very quickly into digital currency. But I think it's interesting to note that for whatever reasons, people want to hold on to a little bit of anonymity for some transactions. And I, I presume that continuing demand for cash reflects that concern about demand for anonymity. I'm quite a skeptic on things like Bitcoin and thinking that they're going to replace uh, government control currency. I think that I think they're a speculative asset and have nothing to do with transactions. So I would put them in a very different category. Uh, let's turn to climate. Uh, sure. Uh, I can't remember the options you gave me on your menu of controversial uh, <laughs> uh, uh, choices, but 
I think I'm in favor of all of them. Um, but I think, no, because I think, <laughs> because I think underlying all of them is the kind of most controversial change, which is actually a political one. And I think we're starting to see it, which is the shift from an interest in kind of incrementalism to a shift to more kind of transformative ways of dealing with this problem. And, you know, I think that's in, in a lot of ways what this kind of new appetite for the Green New Deal reflects, this idea that climate change as a problem is something like a world war or something like a Great Depression. The difference is that we can see it coming. Um, so, so I think that, you know, now the kind of, I think the controversial ideas that are really interesting to me are things like the universal basic income, which, I think isn't typically talked about as a climate change story, but it is if you think about changing the way that we work, changing the meaning of work, changing the distribution of working hours over the population. Um, so these are some of the kind of controversial ideas that, that appeal to me, but I don't think that anything that you named isn't you know, a potential part of it. But again, I think underlying it is, is a kind of fundamentally political shift. George, on the, globe, the glo global governance for older people, is that the question? <laughs> well, I mean, I'll tell you something. If you want to answer the a different one, you're welcome to. <laughs> of, um, of demographic change is, I think, really interesting because, again, it's varied. And it's going to be about the management of difference, the management of plurality here. Because some parts of the world are getting older. Europe, including Russia here, uh, is getting older for lots of very good reasons, although the latest metrics aren't great in terms of life expectancy. But in general, the pattern's been towards people living older and them not being sufficiently replaced. Then you have someone like the US, which is a much more mixed picture, um, partly because it's got more immigrants, so it has a better rate of replacement, but also because first-generation immigrant families are often bigger. Um, then China's a really interesting mixed story where they're going to try and change uh, policy to try and uh, not have this kind of demographic time bomb. I think the really interesting part to look at is the places in the world that are going to get younger. So someone like Sub-Saharan Africa is going to have far more people than it does at the moment and far greater share of the world's population. So the optimistic scenario there is that becomes hugely dynamic, um, linked to education, linked to uh, forms of engagement and learning that help uh, to recalibrate world order in interesting ways. But with the themes of the evening, slightly more pessimistic way of thinking about that is I actually work most substantively on revolutions. And revolutions almost always happen in young countries because they're also forms of unrest. As you get these large young populations uh, trying to uh, make their way and sometimes being stymied uh, by various forms of governance, by also uh, by older populations. So again, I think it makes this point about world order is going to be about the management of difference and the management of these different demographic patterns that we're seeing about the world and how quickly uh, we can adapt how successful and more robust the institutions that we have and those that we will create to help deal with these broader uh, demographic changes. And it comes back to something quite a lot of us have mentioned, the quality of leadership is going to matter hugely, both in individual societies, but also uh, greater than that. And I'll leave it up to you about whether you think you're optimistic or pessimistic about that. <laughs> now, actually, I've just realized we're going to, we have to vote. So, um, I, what I'm going to, we are going to offer everyone drinks outside, and so I think we'll take the remaining questions maybe bilaterally, if that's okay. And I will ask you please to pick up your voting, your little plastic keypad. And no, we can't vote. Yeah, we can't vote. No, we can't. <laughs> and the question for the evening is: Do you feel more optimistic or pessimistic about the world's future? And A is mostly optimistic, B is mostly pessimistic. And we will let it run for a few minutes, for a minute or two, and see where you come out. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's even much longer. It starts optimistic. <laughs> no, it's it was like, I know, you feel like it's a bit of a referendum on your own. You can ask for any people. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, that'd be quite that'd interesting. Be that'd be quite interesting. Right. Be interesting. Okay. okay. We managed. Okay. Managed I nice. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> okay. So we move the dial. We move the dial on optimism. It would be very interesting to have a few people who voted optimistic 
to say why. Would anyone like to volunteer why they voted, or even a pessimist, why you voted the way you did? Just a few, just to get a flavor for, um, yes, the gentleman here, and then I need a woman. I need a woman to tell me. Ah, okay, I'll take the one from London School of Hygiene again. <laughs> Go ahead, tell me why, how, why you voted the way you did. Uh, sorry, right here, in the beige jacket, beige brown jacket, yeah. Primarily be, uh, down to uh, what Professor Walson just referred to, la la the utter lack um, of leadership and uh, B, demographics. So you were pessimistic. You were pessimistic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Where are you? This, actually, this was also, I, this was the thing that came up the first day, the pessimism bias. The optimists don't tend to speak up. They're not on Twitter, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's interesting. Do we have any optimists in there? Is an optimist there? And well, you, you were a pessimist because you're a climate, you're worried about climate change. What about the gentleman here? <laughs> I'm 68 years old. I've lived through some fascinating times. I think that everything I see of young people impresses me. I think the people I've seen in the four events I've been here have been massively impressive, even though I've disagreed massively with so many of them. <laughs> and you, you look at the brain power on that panel, and I think we've got a hell of a lot to feel good about. There's a lot of bad to talk about, but, and I'm on Twitter, incidentally. And, <laughs> and so it's a positive day. Feel positive. As the, as the director of the LSE, I feel incredibly proud of the brain power at, uh, on this panel, and I'm really delighted and grateful to all of them for being here this evening and spending their Saturday nights. And I do hope, I, I, I quite agree with the sentiment, uh, again, being at the LSE and seeing the incredible energy and talent of young people today. And so everyone in this room who is a millennial, you're why we voted this way, <laughs> and we're all counting on you. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you for coming to the festival.